So I'm here to introduce the Medicine Foundation and Frontiers panel, uh, moderated by Dr. Deepthi Desai. The panel includes Dr. Peshwa, Dr. Singhvi, Dr. Gupta, and Mr. Kumar. Uh, it's a multifaceted and distinguished group of people that have been reshaping the medical landscape in their own way. Their collective expertise spans cellular therapy, resilience-focused healthcare, academic research, innovative diagnostics, and compassionate leadership. Uh, they and you will engage in the meeting of the minds to bridge the gap between the fundamentals of which the current medical field was built and the space age of the medical technology and practice they are working towards. Thanks to professionals like them, doing the work that most of us cannot understand, at least I can't, we can look forward to a brighter future. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear us? I guess, yeah. So thank you, Rachit, for that introduction. And thank you to the audience for all coming here, those that are sitting here in this room, and also I believe we are live streaming, so those that are present remotely. And the session is all on medicine, foundations, and frontiers. And today we'll be exploring the dynamic interplay between the established pillars in medicine, the old way of doing medicine, and then also the groundbreaking stuff that's happening, uh, the innovation, which is the theme of this uh, conference, which is innovation for a better world. So we'll delve into that essential knowledge that forms the bedrock, uh, the core for care, and also we'll kind of cast a spotlight on some of the innovative trends and um, innovative technologies that are being adopted by some of our panelists over here, and that has the potential to transform healthcare. But before I begin, I just want to share some of the nuggets of information that I heard from previous speakers over here at this conference. And the first one was at our uh, keynote given by Dr. Kosla, uh, where you know it struck me that you know what he said is that we'll see tremendous societal change. Uh, we'll see a huge change in the next 25 years that has not happened in the past 200 years. And guess what's all behind it is technology, right? And he also said another very important thing, and he said that we'll see 10x growth, right? But without 10x the resources. So then that like tells me, what are we all going to be doing? <laughs> so that's something to think about. And another thing that he said was that innovations, large innovations come from, and, and this was exemplified by our previous speaker here, large innovations come not from those that are within the industry, but from outside the industry. It's the engineers that are going to transform healthcare. And I have this panel over here that's filled with some of them, so I'm really excited to be talking to them today. Um, I, I, and what we'll be talking about will be the adaption of technology in healthcare. It's the cloud, the AI ML, the large uh, models, um, uh, the infra, and how it's being used in biotech, in life sciences, in uh, digital health, in clinical trials, um, et cetera. So on this panel, I have uh, thought leaders, um, fellow IIT engineers, some of which uh, may be your classmates over here. Uh, Dr. Um, actually Rahul Singhvi, he, he carries out actually manufacturing 4.0, and he'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we have Dr. Madhusudan Peshwa, he's into gene editing and he'll be talking about that. Dr. Anita Gupta, she's been transforming clinical trials, so we'll hear about that too. And we have Samant Kumar, who's developing a lab in the cloud. So I'm really excited about some of that, but we don't just want to hear from the people on the podium. We want to hear from all of you, the audience. And so I believe, I somehow thought there was a microphone here that you could stand and ask, but there's also an app. So we want your questions in that app, so as you're listening to them, start putting in those questions so that I can then look at them on my phone and kind of help uh, get those addressed by the speakers. So, so uh, as I, I know that questions will come in, so before that, I would love for this panel to introduce themselves and kind of share some of the work that they have been doing in healthcare. And um, I know we have limited time, so I would say if we can limit it to like maybe three, four, five minutes um, each, and then uh, we'll have some questions coming in. So um, we'll start with Dr. Sengwi. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dithi, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you, Ratnesh, for inviting me, and 
very happy that my wife Anushree is here, without whom I wouldn't be on this stage. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I, I uh, started my career uh, about 35 years ago. I, I studied at IIT Kanpur, chemical engineering, uh, and was very privileged to um, study here in the United States at MIT. And uh, then I had about a 27-year uh, period during which um, I went to large and small companies, Merck, uh, Takeda, big companies and small companies. Um, and about three and a half years ago, I got a call from an old friend uh, right in the middle of the pandemic uh, and said, Rahul, we have a shit show. Uh, we cannot get any supplies uh, because China is closed. And we got to figure out a way to like, change this. And by the way, this was something that Vinod Kosla mentioned this morning, yeah. is that one of the sort of key inflection points was that COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which basically told us that the whole idea of globalization was a bit naive, because it didn't factor in things like pandemics and geopolitical tensions that can completely ruin yeah. the whole supply chain. And, and so that led to the formation of this company, Resilience, uh, to make supply chains more resilient, particularly uh, the vulnerabilities around vaccines and, and antibodies that can be, uh, if, if you don't have them, you can destroy the entire population. Yeah. So this is a, a matter of national security to some extent. But you, of course, cannot build a company to deal with episodic e events like pandemics. So there has to be some sustainable reason to, to make a company. And it just turned out, and this is the theme here, is the innovations in genomics that we've been observing over the past couple of decades have left, led to these incredible like platforms that uh, Peshwa will talk about and others um, that can cre create these curative therapies, cell and gene therapies that can cure people. But these medicines are very, very different. These medicines are not like small molecules like the tablets and capsules that we pop every day. These are viruses, lipid nanoparticles, mRNA, um, very complex stuff. And, um, the manufacturing of these type of medicines is not well understood. Mm -hmm. And so the resilience was formed to address these two problems. First, to figure out a way that you can onshore manufacturing in a way using technology so you can transcend any issues related to like arbitrage on labor costs, et cetera, so that you can be globally competitive even if you produce a product in this country, right. number one, and, and, and create a more sustainable, reliable, resilient supply chain. Mm -hmm. And second, to become an athlete in manufacturing so that this company can solve the problems of the future. So, so you don't have everybody doing everything, which is the problem in our industry. Yeah. So uh, the idea is that we create a company that is focused only on how to make these complex vaccines and drugs faster, cheaper, better, mm -hmm. that we can make these drugs accessible and affordable for population at large irrespective of economic background. That's the mission of the company, using our superpowers in biomanufacturing mm -hmm. and using technology uh, to really transcend any potential arbitrage or related to labor costs. Uh, so that's the, that's the mission of the company. That's what we're doing. And that's um, so impressive. Excited, excited to it, talk more about it. it. Exa exactly, and it happened because nobody had predicted it, that the pandemic is going to happen, and that happened, and that changed everything. It changed the whole level playing field, and um, resilience was born out of a necessity, right? It's not easy to do manufacturing. You saw manufacturing move out of the U.S. into other countries, and bringing it back into the U.S., you have to do something truly transformative. So. Exactly. This is great, yeah. So, Dr. Peshwa, you're, you're into some really exciting work. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, and thanks introduce to, yourself. Yeah, absolutely. To you. Thanks to the organizers for the invite. Uh, it is, I'll, I'll start off by making two observations. It's indeed a great honor to follow Ratnesh Spano <laughs> and Dr. Jane's talk, yeah. both from IIT Kanpur. And if I look at my co-panelists here, we're well, majority of us are IIT Kanpur. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So Kanpur is doing something right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't see in the glaring. <laughs> I, I can't see in the glare of the lights, but I don't know if Dr. Karandikar is in the audience. But in his leader, during his leadership, Kanpur has established a biological science and biological engineering discipline. And more recently, a medical school. And that is just fantastic, right? And we are sort of maybe representation 
of where the future of engineering is in being able to impact healthcare. <laughs> now, now that I have the audience fully engaged. <laughs> Nothing like a good fight between the campuses, right? <laughs> so, so where I am right now, I'm with a gene editing company. It's called Tessera Therapeutics. It's based in Boston area. Uh, what we do is we use an all RNA-based approach without any DNA, without any viruses, to specifically, with high fidelity, processivity, and efficiency, make changes to the DNA of a cell. And why are we doing this? Essentially what Rahul talked about. We want to be able to fix the root cause of the disease rather than curing the symptoms of the disease, right? And so Dr. Jane's presentation talked about how disease biology is complex. You need to understand from a systems perspective who all the actors are and how can you pre-program cells or organs or tissues such that they will perform specific biological activities in spatial and temporal manner that leads to meaningful clinical benefit. That's the goal. So I'm sort of representing what I would call the fourth pillar in our healthcare, mm -hmm. which is regenerative therapies that have the ability to either stop progression, reverse progression, and cure diseases. And I've been involved in this field for about 30 plus years. And I have to thank Rahul, to some extent, for the journey I embarked on. So he and I are one year apart from IIT Kanpur. He went to MIT for his PhD. He also had an offer from University of Minnesota. <laughs> and Minnesota was ranked number one at that time. And I got an offer from the University of Minnesota. And all my professors sat me down. My head of department called me and said, Rahul didn't go to Minnesota. You cannot reject the Minnesota offer. <laughs> so I ended up going, doing my PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota. And my basic training is in biologics manufacturing, but I got fascinated with using cells as drug products. So I trained with an eyelid transplant surgeon, a liver transplant surgeon, and what became my dissertation was to build a bioartificial liver as a bridge to transplantation for patients who were waiting for a donor organ to become available. And my supervisors decided to spin it out into a startup company. So I was the startup company for a year and a half. And in the late 80s, early 90s, I was involved in raising seed money, filing IP, hiring a CEO, filing an IND. Now keep in mind, the FDA did not have guidance or regulations for cell therapies until 1997. So that was a fantastic learning experience, right? So as a chemical engineer, what do you do? You go back to basic principles. You kind of logically construct sequences that you have to construct in terms of what execution plan you need to follow, and you execute on that. And I was fortunate after grad school, I ended up with a company called Dendrion. Dendrion's credited being, with being the first company to develop an active cellular immunotherapy as a treatment for prostate cancer. And I was fortunate to be involved all the way from ideation to commercial development of that particular drug product, which still sells a couple hundred million dollars in annual revenues even today, 10 years plus post approval. And that was a fantastic journey. And during my career, I've been involved in challenges on business aspects, licensing aspects, functional operation of P&Ls for multiple cell and gene therapy companies. I've been also fortunate to have friends who I've co-founded two companies with in the past. And that's sort of been my journey. One of the things Dipti asked me to talk about is the themes of the panel, right? When we think about cell and gene therapies, the last six months, we've seen about six product approvals in the US by the FDA. And it is fascinating to see that pace of development. But one of the things we have to keep in mind is, you know, maybe this field is most exemplified by CAR T cells, if you've heard of them. Just because the efficacy profile is far greater than any known drug to treat oncology today. That's a very powerful statement, right? Now, when we think about this, there's six CAR T products approved in the US, three in China, how many of you know there's one approved product in India and a second in pivotal phase three development? 
Similarly, when you think about stem cells, there's a company in Bangalore called Stemputics mm -hmm. that has two commercially approved stem cell drugs on the market in India. So as we think about innovation, driving down cost of goods from a manufacturing perspective, creating global access, democratizing these therapies, there's a lot we're gonna learn from our colleagues who are innovating alongside us in China and in India. And in the context of India rising, when you think about this, which is a the theme of this conference, right? I would encourage all of you to look east, establish relationships, collaborations, mentor, invest, and help bring some of these really innovative drug products to the global marketplace. And that ties in with the current government's political will, ambition, regulatory support, and the infrastructure and ecosystem that they're creating from that perspective. The other theme that Dipti wanted me to talk about very briefly was this whole concept of AI. We are today in this world, and Samanth will talk more about this, in the context of data and data-driven decision-making. And how do you go bigger, stronger, and faster becomes really a unique opportunity to disrupt the whole process of developing curative therapies. For example, the best data set we have is millions and millions of years of Mother Nature's evolution, right? And so part of Tessera's technology, where I currently am, is based on actually mining DNA sequences to find these gene editing tools that are able to very safely and reliably change the DNA structure without cutting the DNA like what nucleases do. So if you can kind of think about how you can apply some of these generated AI tools, go back to learnings from nature, and apply those tools above and beyond what someone will talk about in terms of accelerating the discovery in the R&D process itself. I think that's, again, a unique opportunity. So all of you in this audience, you know, you are at the cusp of an explosion of innovation in this particular field. And it's a very fortunate time, it gives a lot of us meaning and purpose behind what it is that we're doing, which is one of the themes that came up in this morning as well. And we have, we, 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 although we sit here and talk about it, we all stand on the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. uh, uh, sitting in the audience as well. So clearly, I think it takes a community, it takes a village to make things happen. I, I look forward to questions and further discussion. Thank you. And I just said, many people enter healthcare uh, to make an impact to give back in some way and to improve health. Right? So it's really good. And another thing that uh, Dr. Peshwa mentioned is India, India rising and how healthcare, and India is doing something truly transformational that I don't think it's possible even in the US. Right? India was able to manufacture vaccines for the world. India has been able to create a health stack. I don't know how many of you know about it. And in another session, I heard about UPI, right? And not many people know about all that. But it's really amazing what the government has been able to do for India, which in this country we can't do. That's why US has this very fragmented approach towards healthcare. But we'll get into that later because I still want to make sure that our panelists get an opportunity to introduce themselves and talk a little bit more about what they're doing. So Dr. Nita. Yeah, so hi everyone. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Amita Gupta. I'm uh, the Division Director of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins University. And I don't think I have to tell the audience what an infectious diseases specialist does because we've just emerged from this crazy pandemic or we're still dealing with obviously COVID going around. But um, I have been sort of, I actually did engineering first. So I was one of those engineer doctors. And I always uh, used, when I'd go back home to India, they'd be like, engineering and doctor? How did you do that? Because in the United States, you can do that. Um, so uh, after graduating from MIT, I went to um, Harvard Medical School and I ended up getting very interested in global health. And it was at the time that HIV was really a huge problem. Um, in fact, my floor mate in my engineering college unfortunately died of HIV, and it sort of really gave me the impetus to get involved. And that's how I got sort of politically and medically interested in the disease. And so I'll weave in the fact that back in um, 1991 when I graduated, there wasn't really anything other than AZT, which was the one drug available to treat HIV. By 1996, you could take 24 pills a day, four times a day, with several toxicities. 
um, and deal with um, trying to keep yourself alive. That was a turning point because we ended up with three drugs uh, classes to really sort of take a uniformly fatal disease to a disease that now is uh, chronically you can deal with. But what's amazing now in 2024 is thanks to technology and engineers and really learning what you can do with drug formulations, we have nano formulations where we can take drugs and they can be injected and last for six months. So we are actually now at this precipice through clinical trials, through understanding chemical engineering and understanding biology, taking something that used to take 24 pills of toxicity and sort of really horrible, not very tolerable, to now treatments that last six months with one injection, and it's incredible. So in my lifetime, a fatal disease to now something that we can treat with really new um, ways of approaching. I also work in tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is a disease where unfortunately India ranks number one. Um, we have 2.4 million cases that occur each year, 10 million cases in the world. And unfortunately, there's over a billion people infected, in fact, almost 2 billion, depending on what data you look at, that have the infection but don't have the disease. And in that same way, uh, tuberculosis for 40 years had no drug discovery. It was the same drugs, and, not, and we'd use the four drugs and nothing else for 40 years. And then finally, actually, through investment of NIH, the Gates Foundation, and some uh, pharmaceutical companies interested, there was a whole slew of new chemical entities that have been brought to the market. And what that's resulted in is us, people like me, figuring out what combinations of these chemical ent entities can we combine to make treatment safer, shorter, and better, and more curative. And so now we've gone with a disease that has, if you have multi-drug resistant or what we call extremely drug resistant TB, which is a huge problem in Mumbai, where you could have the same mortality as pancreatic cancer in some instances, where um, eight, you know, up to 80% would die if you had XDRTB, to now we can do six months of a treatment of three new chemical entities and have essentially a 90% cure rate. That's all in the last 10 years, which is incredible. So I'm very excited by seeing what we can do in this space with taking engineer, medicine, combining, and then using things like clinical trial innovation to come up with really landmark, uh, groundbreaking, and changing therapeutics that really can have an impact. That's so impressive because, uh, again, tuberculosis is a, a problem that doesn't exist in this country. So not much research is done there. A lot of work is done in India. And I just met a really young company called Arogya.ai, which is doing some work there, which is using AI to actually bring in some new ways of doing uh, therapies by minimizing the amount of drugs, et cetera. So really cool work going on there. Uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, you're doing something. I'm not doctor. No. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another engineer uh, who has now moved into healthcare, <laughs> Samant Kumar, um, you've been working on uh, creating something that all of us are looking for, a lab in the cloud. So do you want to talk, thank introduce you. yourself and talk a little yeah. bit about it? Thank you. It. Thank you for coming here, yeah. inviting me. Thank you, Ratnis. And that was a nice talk. I learned a lot in your, <laughs> the Jan, your last lecture. So I think I am the, I'm the literally representing the masses from IIT who do not know biology, but still they want to do it. So my background, I did IIT, uh, electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur in 1995 and graduated somehow. By the time I graduated, I could crack that how to get good CPI or CGPA, but it took four years to understand that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was very logical way somehow I came. After that, I didn't have the patience to do for anything higher. I just went into the field and do it. And I like the hardware telecommunication because I grew up in a village. Only one thing used to be there called radio at that time in 1980s. And that was connection to the world. I used to listen to all the India radio, BBC, uh, you just name it, Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation, Ceylon. You can't be heard. Oh, okay. Is it fine now? Yeah. Okay. So, so I wanted to be electronics engineer, when, at least I wanted to understand how the communication works. And I, to Kanpur, I went there, one of the course we did, I didn't understand anything after that, how the radio communication works, because it was too theoretical. <laughs> Only noise and Shannon theorem and all these things went, but anyway, that's fine. So I wanted to fix that and I joined Indian Telephone Industry Limited to do hardware telecom. I bid that, deployed that, all the things, then I joined 
uh, one startup in India, government of India, and I was not planning to come to US. And then I ended up ultimately then to uh, Lucent Bell Labs, and I was roaming around and then joined startup in uh, Silicon Valley. I thought that, okay, well, that's the Macaf technology, so we, I should be there. And then after that, I, I was there for TI, in the TI, making voice over IP system and all those things. And then after I started my own de deployment in India, people are talking about India, so I always, always thought that India is there. <laughs> so it's last 10, 15 years, I keep trying. I was an ISP, IPTV platform I launched before when the digitization was happening from the cable TV to do it. I spent time there. Then ISP, when the last mile connectivity, rural broadband, still it runs in 225 gram panchayats. So the services are there. Then I came back and realized, okay, India is still, it can wait. So let's work on this and all the other things. Then I was in PwC, launched a learning platform based upon enterprise learning platform based upon AI, now transformer and all the things are buzzword, but that time people used to say it's like magic. But anyway, after that, but I have personal story for that one. Uh, I, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer, metastasized, when we did PET scan, it was all over the place. And after I did the Google search everywhere how to fix it, Everywhere, all these quackery things are going on. You can do silica therapy. I still remember, I don't know what that do. It will kill the tumors and all the things. Obviously, we gave up. And then I wanted to come back to that. Always I was doing that, but okay, immediately I had to come back. When I reached 50, I thought that, okay, enough is enough. I need to make sure that I do not die like that. So it was selfish motive. And then I was funding a couple of people from Stanford PhD and all the things to do immunotherapy. I thought that that's the one thing. They just told me that that's the frontier, new antigen and all the things. Funding it, uh, they were doing it, it was taking time and the COVID hit and it was very difficult to go to the lab and all those things. Then I would just keep thinking what to do, what to do. I said, okay, we need to solve this one. I don't need to be in the lab. Obviously, the people who are biologists were there, they, they have no way to understand that. Okay, let me try that myself. I learned myself doing pipetting and all those things. I say that after that few, few weeks, they say that it looks like you have 10 years of experience. I said, good, at least I, I know how to do pipetting and all those things. Then I went back myself and we working with that. We got some liquid handler and all the things. I bought literally from my own Illumina sequencing machine because I wanted to play with that and see what is that mystery is, unless until we understand uh, uh, the, the, the thing in the, the gene, gene, how do we fix that? So that happened and then we have some whole pipeline, we build it and then now we are using our own pipeline to do some of that stuff. And then suddenly we had many startups who said, okay, that's a good one, I can use that. Since it's like a lab, it's okay, then the, it's like a data center, computing went to data center. And then data center self serve become cloud computing. So it's okay, then we can slap top of that the virtualization layer. Mm -hmm. Then you have virtual sequencer, you have all the virtual instruments and you can create the whole pipeline into that. So it was just curiosity and some of the things I call it basically, the ignorance is bliss. So if you are coming from outside, you do not know what is difficult and what is easy. You attack anything which looks like logical. And that may be asset many times because you are on the margins and you can do that. So then we were doing that. Then we, then we started looking into the how to do the procedure because cancer is like a precision medicine type of thing. So how do you do that? You need to precisely know everything, is it? That's the word, definition of the word. Then you said that, okay, the, the FDA clearance and all the things, if you take that end of one trial because cancer, everybody is different cancer. They do not have, they are always looking for something which goes into thousand people. How do you do that if it is one person? Okay, so then we need to create most of the thing done in in vitro validation. Isn't? Can I do something 99.99% validation or do that? And you know that last year, uh, the FDA 2.0 came where can you do IND application just by going in vitro validation and all the things? You don't need to go mice model, although it's very important, but some of the things you can do to make sure that toxicity is not there, efficacy, uh, all these things are there to do that. So, and that's what the, the, the thing excites me. And I, uh, then we went to diagnostics was happening and some of the people came. So essentially, you've been able to create a lab in the cloud, yeah. which uh, everybody, all the scientists back in our days when we were doing pipetting and everything were envisioning. So is that a reality now? Is yeah, that, it's a reality what, now. What we, is, have the, uh, have, we have we are using it for our own, and that we have some uh, customers who are using it. In fact, what happened that there, there, there is some of the things which you're seeing, the, the, especially if you look at the right now, automation is happening where you have replaced human hand with a 
robotic hand. Yeah. But that's not the way biology works, isn't it? Biology works in vessels and all those things. So think of microfluid is probably maybe near to that one. So we are working on that, some of the things to disrupt the whole lab. You run, you can, microprocessor processor moment. Can you run the whole essay into a microfluidic environment or not? Because that's more contained, you know how it fix. no problem, you can create a lab on chip, you can have organ on chip. Who knows there can be organism on a chip and then you can have a model of my avatar there and I can validate all these things. <laughs> so so there's, there's so many interesting things, at least from outside. Yeah. So I know we only have 10 minutes, at least this timer tells me only 10 minutes are remaining to this panel, but I don't see any questions from the audience, so there may be a glitch in the system, uh, but we will ask questions over there, and uh, do you guys, uh, uh, Rajit, do you have the questions? Yeah. Okay. So he has a couple of questions here. And thank you very much for telling uh, what you are passionate about and what you're working on and what's exciting. I know we wanted to go into a lot more things, but uh, let's at least start with these two questions. Uh, what are the areas of biomedicine that you think are the ripest and what areas do you think are underrepresented? Uh, who is this question from? Ah, okay, do you have it for any specific uh, panelist? No, it's not for Okay, anybody wants to take it? It's a very broad question. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's very hard to answer in a very succinct yeah. manner. Yeah. Maybe maybe we can follow up uh, uh, yeah. offline after the panel, uh, specifically in terms of what your interest might be, unless some of the other panelists want to. I mean, at least I feel that what happens is it depends on the country and the representation of uh, what is needed in that country. In the US, uh, it's different. In India, it's different. Like India, big in diabe diabetes and uh, hypertension and cardiac markers. In the US also, probably the same chronic disorders, but there's also rare diseases and there's also uh, infectious diseases, right? Which of course everybody keeps thinking will eradicate it, but it's not happening. So I, I think it's, uh, well, there are some areas that are uh, already, people have got large molecules in, but again, it's a very broad uh, question. I think it depends on a lot of different parameters. Um, a bunch of questions from the audience here too. I think this got locked out again, so can you <laughs> please <laughs> stand up? And yeah. Yeah. Uh, based on all of your amazing presentation, for cardiovascular disease, mode of gene therapy, mm -hmm. endocrine, it is very important for holistic disease management and kidney resolution and bone. How do you see a vision? What are the obstacles? What barriers for patients to try to look into that for commercialization? Boy, again, a very, uh, thank you for the question. It's a very uh, detailed question as well again, right? So again, it all comes down to how much of the biology we understand. Because our ability to impact it in terms of being able to modify course of disease comes down to how confident we feel in terms of what genetic factors may be involved. It's not a single gene. It's a multi-parametric approach. And does the approaches based on our current understanding of biology give us sufficient uh, benefit to risk analysis in that particular patient population, right? In cancer, if a patient is in fourth line, fifth line, it's gonna survive three months to six months, it's a completely different risk benefit analysis than say in cardiovascular disease where the, where the individual is very, very healthy and will survive for decades. Also from the digital health perspective, I feel that we are actually approaching all these chronic diseases pretty late, right? We push it, push it, push it out, we should be more proactive. But the reason we can't be proactive is because we don't have all the data. The data is all fragmented and sitting in different silos. You have the payer data in one place, you have the provider data in another place, the pharma data in the third place, the clinical trial data in the fourth place, and the systems don't talk to one another. There's a huge, huge, huge data aggregation issue. And in addition to that, the ecosystem issue too. Uh, people that are payers don't talk to providers, providers don't talk to the, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Pharma, clinic, they all need to be working together. And that's something that I do, so that I'm really passionate about it. Might 
So maybe I can just quickly add. So there's a company called Verve Therapeutics. Verve Therapeutics. That they're looking at um, a gene uh, editing approach to reducing cholesterol. Um, uh, the genes are known, uh, and so uh, the, they, they're giving these medicines one shot that can uh, go into the liver and, and fix it. And so your production of um, um, LDL is reduced. So I think that's an example of what can be possible. Now, is it for everybody? No. Uh, it's going to be expensive, and uh, only those people that have that cannot be served with the more, you know, more tolerable and cheaper therapies like statins or PSKS or whatever they're called. Absolutely, PKS is my It's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to understand more about the biology. Yeah. Great question. <clears throat> so the question was, uh, uh, what can we do diagnostically to rapidly diagnose uh, both what the infection is and what the big data uses there are? So um, I'll answer that in a few ways. Um, so right now, we're going through a revolution. So one of the areas of biomedical medicine is diagnostics. Um, there's just an incredible ability to diagnose in so many different ways, whether it's the host, the pathogen, or both. Um, and so uh, we're using um, all of those types of signatures to really better understand, one, if it's a virus, is it a bacteria, is it a parasite? What that, so that's one area of big data. The other is using platforms, which can be you know, genetics, could be RNA, could be DNA, could be um, microfluidics. There's just a whole host of approaches to diagnosing pathogens. And combining that with informatics um, to really get at pattern recognition so we can sort of see if you have a million people and you've applied a certain particular test, what's the sensitivity specificity? So I would say we're, um, you know, we're at this point where we're going to see a lot of really, really cool ways of very quickly differentiating uh, what the diagnosis is and what's the resistance profile so we can very quickly target the right um, therapeutic. So precision diagnosis with precision therapy is the way of the future. Um, and we'll be able to hopefully do that with even understanding the host, because not everybody responds um, in the same way to a therapy. So between the diagnosis and the therapy, using big data to really analyze that and be able to do precision medicine is what we're all working on in some shape or form. Yeah. So, so that is definitely one of the biggest things. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see this exponential advancement in tools and technologies, right? So people were familiar with zinc finger nucleases and omega nucleases uh, 20 years ago. These were very complex molecules to synthesize. It would take you like a year and multiple liquid handlers to actually make a single molecule that you could take forward, right, into testing and screening activities. Now, with the advent of CRISPR 10 years ago, what happened was high school kids could actually design the CRISPR molecule in a matter of a couple of days, right? So that led to this massive acceleration. And what we see is more recently, a couple weeks ago, months ago, CRISPR Therapeutics and uh, Vertex got approval for the first ever CRISPR-modified stem cell therapy for treating sickle cell disease. Uh, and, and that was enabled largely, and there's, uh, in, in, in the audience, there's an individual from a company called Maxite which allowed the delivery of these molecules into the stem cells in a very benign manner to preserve the ability to see functional responses going forward. Long story short, we now have <coughs> options and opportunities for patient treatment. But beyond CRISPRs, which emerged 10 years ago, there's been continuing advancement in tools. 
So now we have base editing, we have prime editing, and we have TESRAS technology that we call gene writing. TESRAS technology originates from a discovery made in the 1970s by Barbara Mleklintov, for which she was awarded the Nobel Prize. And it's based on looking at jumping genes in plants. And so there are a variety of retrotransposons of different clouds that exist through the kingdom of life. And so TESRA has basically used bioinformatics to identify putative <coughs> sequences, isolate them, design them, engineer them, and repurpose them to do what we want them to do, rather than to do what they naturally do. And I just want to add to that that we are almost at the end of time. And who knows, from gene editing and uh, gene um, de creating designer uh, drugs, yeah. drugs, and not only designer drugs, you can extrapolate it to design or humans, right? <laughs> so I know that there's a lot more questions here, and we are out of time, but we, we are great. The good thing is we have a 10-minute uh, break, so we can continue on. But I know. Do, no, we can't continue on. So I guess uh, that's what I'm hearing from back there. Yeah. Is it possible? Maybe, I think what we should do is we should just ask the question. Um, uh, let's end this session, and then we can continue with the conversation in the 10-minute break. Apologies for that, but I know that uh, they have to. Yeah. Thank you very much, panelists and audience.